So something slightly special here today at the Sub Company. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, we're joined by Michael Booth and Kai Lenny. Um, if you're into stand-up paddleboarding, surfing, any type of water sport, um, they're names that will be familiar to you. Um, Michael, Kai, both, thank you very much for joining us here um, at Facebook in London. Uh, quick shout out to Kyle from Facebook. Thanks for hooking us up. Um, London, first stop on the APP World Tour. Um, you guys have been to the city before at all, or? Yeah, I've been here before, just never to race, so this is going to be, you know, really exciting, fun experience. Well, the course looks insane. I mean, the first Saturday is from Battersea down to the Houses of the Parliament, I think. I don't think you're going to get a chance to do much sightseeing along the way, um, so if you want to get any of that in now, I suggest you do it after we've done yeah. it on Facebook. Yeah, oh, it's my, it's my third or fourth time here, so I've all done all the sightseeing I need to do, I think, and then uh, I think I think we head down bum up in that race. Head down, down think, that's for sure, yeah. yeah race on. So, I mean, with the event and so on, I appreciate the two of you here um, competing in your own individual right. Uh, challenges, who stands out for you really as competition? Oh, obviously um, Kai, um, Mo Freitas, uh, Connor Baxter, Travis Grant, like all these guys are sort of legends of the sport and been around for a long time and uh, it's going to be no easy feat to come out on top on the, on Sunday. Well, you're coming into the event really with a target on your back as well, off the back of a really strong win. Yeah. Yeah, no, the Euro Tour was fantastic for me. Um, coming away with the win again and going back to back on that was um, one of my goals at the start of the year. And uh, the APP World Tour is something that I've really set my sights on again this year. And hopefully, I can get a better result than I did last year. And um, absolutely love to win it. But um, it's just another challenge and another, I don't know, etch in your in your book. For sure. So, how does it stack up as an event in terms of the calendar of the four? There's one that really stands out in terms of San Francisco and the Red Bull Heavy Water event. Um, is that something you, you're eyeing up in particular, Kai, or...? Yeah, that's definitely, I think, of all the events on the tour, it's my favorite, just because I love big waves. And last year we had, like, pretty big waves, so it was, uh, you know, it just adds a whole nother dynamic to it, because you literally could train as hard as you can for, you know, the race, and there's still a lot of odds that are, you know, not in your favor or could be in your favor. You know, you could get that crazy wave and make it, and then, at the same time, you can be paddling out and get absolutely smashed. So, I think the best part about this tour, though, is like for me, coming from a sort of surf background mainly, is that I get to come to these large cities and appreciate and compete where, you know, surfing and these other sports that I do don't necessarily get to come. And so, when you can mesh that all, like in San Francisco for Red Bull Heavy Water, um, that one is like, it's kind of like the meeting of two worlds, you know, big waves in a big city. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a, probably the uh, the best way to, um, yeah, I think experience racing to, in my eyes. But then, so in terms of preparation for that though, so I'm picking it slightly where that's just one of four events on the APP World Tour. How do you then prepare for flat water events, which primarily has been a real strength for you this year, Michael? Yeah. Um, how do you switch your focus then away from surfing and integrate that into all the other sports that you do? I think, you know, just being like being able to have endurance in waves in itself is good training for anything else that you're going to do because like unlike flat water, the ocean's pretty unrelenting when the waves are coming in and in order to get yourself out of like a big wave situation, you got to, you know, pretty much press on until you're out of there. Whether you're tired or not, it's happening. Um, the thing is though, is like, I think the hardest part about, you know, doing the flat water races is just gaining those miles in flat water. You know, it's, training can be pretty uneventful, you know, yeah. until the race comes around and it becomes very eventful because you have, you know, 30 guys that are just the fastest in the world in your neck, neck with them in flat water and all of a sudden it actually feels pretty intense. So, um, you know, it's just like trying to train up to like doing a flat water race is sometimes more difficult than I think training to do um, to surf big waves. And have you given that special focus in your training and leading up to the APP events for um, preparation for flat water? I, yeah, definitely. I had a, you know, I had some good training time back home. It is difficult because I'm definitely on call if a big swell comes up. So usually in the middle of my training, there'll be a giant swell somewhere in the world. And I'm just like, okay, I'm going. And then, well, there goes a week of, uh, you know, hard training. But at the same time, I look at it as um, sort of been what my strength has been in the past because I've never not done that, you yeah. know, where I haven't, you know, been in a million other things. So I almost don't know any better. And who knows, 
probably could be stronger if I just focus on just one, but it's not really my style. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so Michael, in terms of your preparation, are you, how are you maintaining the fitness level that you've had for the Euro Tour this, this year? Yeah, I think um, for me, like mainly my training sort of happens between like January to March, uh, doing a lot of, I guess last year I wasn't as strong in like the technical style racing or the downwinding and that was something that I, I really wanted to focus on. So a lot of downwinding in the off season, a lot of skills work and then um, having that really good base, I can sort of really try and just maintain it once my way. So you're definitely not getting better. Like this is maybe my seventh week on the road. So. Um, you're just trying to, like I guess like a footballer or something like that, you, you get a really good base in you and then you're just trying to maintain what you already have and um, the racing becomes your hard sessions and then the, the training during the week is just either recovery or just um, maybe one or two hard sessions if you can, if your body can physically feel it, feel ready, feel ready for it and the rest is just, uh, yeah, just trying to maintain. Awesome. Yeah. Then, then kind of flipping the question that Kai's just answered in terms of the Red Bull Heavy Water, yeah. where it would be fair to say that that type of environment and that event, as crazy an event as it is, yeah. have you, are you planning to give that some special focus? Um, for sure, like, so I live in um, Western Australia where we get a lot of big waves down south, so I'll be spending a, a little bit of time down there after Molokai this year and trying to get a little bit of training in, but as Kai said, it's, it's sort of a bit of a luck of the draw, uh, regardless of how much training you've done, like, it's, it, it is really good to be fit in that race. Um, last year, like, I was going in and out through the break and I like, got a two-way hold down, and. I guess that's not really, that's no joke sort of stuff. So yeah. um, you've got to be prepared mentally and physically for that event. You can't just go in and go, I'm really strong, I can catch waves. You've got to be actually mentally strong as well and go, okay, if I do get held down, I know what to do. I know how to maintain my positioning in the, in the break and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, just for that race, it's, it's, it's a lot, well, I think it's a lot more mental than it is physical. And um, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna be looking for rips and currents and different um, avenues to get out. There's not gonna be so a bit more tactical, a bit more strategic as well. Yeah, like I remember coming in last year from like after being washed back to the beach about five times and sort of just standing on the beach, the lifeguard just going, so where's everybody getting out? Like I just, I can't, I can't really work it out because last year obviously we went out on the boat and then had to get the jet ski assist to the start line and none of us knew where we were going. Like we were just going in blind. I think that's the one of the more crazy elements because. When you're, I guess if you're preparing for a heat and surfing, like I don't do it, but I'm sure Kai knows this. Like he's looking at it, preparing for it, watching the surf. Like we didn't see the surf zone for like two and a half hours before the race, so it makes it really hard to know how to get out and where the waves are breaking, that sort of thing. From the back of the break, when all you can see is just like big green lines. It's a nice thing. leveler for the playing field, though, in some respects. Yeah, absolutely. As well. Like even last year, like a couple of guys like went out to start the race and didn't didn't even get out of the boat. So. <laughs> It shows just how, how real that, that race <laughs> is. is yeah. So in terms of training and preparation, you seem to be both in different phases at the moment in terms of you're very much part of the Starville team. Yeah. Kai's very much a free agent in terms of kit and so on at the moment. Do you train as a team? Does that happen or is it you very standalone? Um, I think it's a very individual sport. Um, I've always, I've come from sort of a paddling background. I think it's a bit opposite to Kai, he's come from sort of a surfing background. and. Um, I've always really enjoyed training by myself and uh, being able to coach myself and work out what I need to do to become a better paddler. So um, basically we all train by ourselves. It's very hard to, we're all in different locations around the world. Like you've got Connor in Hawaii, you've got the Shula Rallies in Bali, you've got guys on the east coast of Australia, a couple of guys in Europe. So it's not really possible to train. And when I the sports at the level where you can sort of have a, camp, a team or a camp training. Um, we'd love to get to that level, but uh, at the moment, it's, yeah, it's a very individual sport, and you sort of it's one for all, one for one sort of thing. Yeah, okay. And it's the same for you and Kyrie in terms of your premise, Kai time. Yeah, to you know, we have there's a bunch of really fast paddlers that have come out of Maui in the past and continue to come out of Maui, but it's like Michael said, it's definitely a very individual sport, and um, you know, I think it's it's I think it's really good when you can paddle with people to like sort of help push you and. Um, you know, have that experience of always paddling, like what a race might be. But at the same time, you know, it's like I've always sort of trained on my own as well, just because different approaches, and you know, you don't always want to know what it, where everyone, where you're yeah, at. It's you know in case I mean? of almost not sharing. You're kind of yeah. sandbagging a little bit in terms of keeping something back and not wanting to share that almost. But I mean, it's not like you're. It's, that's just competition in general, and a lot of times, like training with me would be, you know not really training that often just since I 
have a lot of other stuff going on and a lot of time I schedule my training sessions around how the surf is. Yeah. So the surf's really good. I'm definitely going to be surfing and then I'm going to try to fit the paddling in between. You know, I'm not going to be like, okay, 8 a.m. because, and the surf's good somewhere, you know? Yeah. It's like, when's the tide going to be the worst, you know? And I'm going to fit it in then. But I think just a different approach in general. And I, I, I definitely love that feeling. One of my favorite feelings in the world is being out in the middle of the ocean by myself too. And not even like having any safety precautions or anything. It's just something freeing about that, you know? Just like, um, it's, it's uh, you know, just you're outside that kind of norm you know the bubble but training on training is just like however whatever works for you is like how you should approach it <laughs> yeah and in the terms of you being a free agent at the moment and the, the choose your weapon approach that the APP world tour has yeah. to its events I think there's probably an argument that you're in a better position than most if you like in that as fantastic as the starboard range is in terms of with the ace and the all-star and the sprint that you can then kind of flip to and go to as boards, you're in a slightly posi different position and that you don't have those restrictions. You can kind of take what you want from the market. I'm sure there's a lot of partners out there that are quite willing to work with you and give you that opportunity. Um, are we going to see you on an SIC on every stop of the tour? Um, no, I'm actually going to be paddling an infinity board this time. And, uh, you know, those boards tend to work amazing in everything. So it's kind of like, it's with coming to a city and flat water race, it's sometimes like really choppy. So it's kind of nice to have a board that can ride bombs, can sprint really good, you know, can glide in flat water really well. And, uh, you know, I really like the, that piece of equipment. But it's nice because I've definitely had races in the past where I think I could have probably done better if I had a specific board. Yeah. And um, it comes down to the conditions, typically. Um, I wouldn't. I think there's benefits to, to both, you know? Like, I've, I've, I've done both, but being a free agent, if, you, if the conditions are changing really quick, you know, there's no one stopping you from, like, getting or borrowing a board to suit those needs, necessarily. Yeah. So that's pretty rad. It's, it's kind of a cool place to be in, you know? That's fantastic. And as a mic, but in terms of that and the starboard lineup, yep. do you jump across the models at their their very performance end of what they offer? Um, generally, this year, like uh, for all my events this year, I've powered the starboard sprint. Um, it's been a real fantastic board. It's gone from being just a flat water board to being a really all around board. And I think it, there's there's really value in racing on a board that you truly know. Like I think it's great having the opportunity to paddle different boards like Kai's got, but. I think knowing your equipment is half the battle sometimes. Like if you go out into the open ocean um, on a sprint, if you haven't paddled before, you'll fall in every time. But because yeah. I've I've trained on for the past six months, like and that's the only board I've really been paddling. It's it's a, such an advantage to be know know your fin, know you know your board, know how it's going to react in every condition. And um, I'll be paddling the sprint on the weekend, and I think it'll it should do quite well in the conditions that we're going to have. A really strong board in 2018 yeah. for us. It's been a fantastic seller as well. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. The, just the guy at Starboard just doing a fantastic job, like always in, innovating their boards and make their high quality boards. And I'm really lucky to be part of that brand. And in terms of the board development and so on that goes in, yeah. yeah. Do you get a chance to feed back into those designs much? Yeah, absolutely. Like a couple of times a year, I'll go to Starboard and work with Sven, Ollie, and the team, and. Um, we'll, we'll break down what we think is, is, is being working really well and what we think we can change and um, how, how we can always make things better. Like uh, with the Unlimited this year, they'll be racing over in Molokai. Like I, I went over there and actually specifically designed a board that I could race for that race. So um, that'll be really cool to be racing on a board that's designed. Yeah. That'd be awesome. And Kai, in terms of you as a free agent, uh, is there something on the horizon in terms of a Kai Lenny range of boards ultimately? or? Um, I'd Right now, you know, no, because it's just, it's just been fun to ride whatever is the best out there. And I got so used to the equipment I was riding, it worked fantastic, but I'm really interested in not just in my race boards, but with everything, trying to figure out like what the next step could be, you know, that new feeling. When you, when things seem fresh, at least for me, there's like kind of a motivation to try to see where the, the, the edge is, you know, where the, uh, sort of like um where you could even go beyond that you know like something to chase after and just i love that about like having new equipment as well is like knowing that i don't know where the, that end is like i can push it super far so i've been enjoying particularly that a lot and 
I mean, a Kai range would have to be pretty extensive, so it would be a lot of work to have, like, a board for every sport that exists in the water. Right, switch, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, everything. Might take a while. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, awesome. Um, in terms of the APP event then this weekend in London, um, what stands out at the city centre locations is this paddle festival environment that's being built. I think there's intention to get somewhere in the region around 300 you know, amateur pro-amp paddlers at an event alongside the world's best. Um, it's a fairly unique concept. You're gonna get the chance to meet people at the event, do you think? Yeah. Uh, that's coming along? I, I really, like the biggest, best races I've ever been a part of has been when there's a lot of stoked people on the beach and then they're able to sort of be a part of it some way where they do their own races or they learn how to do what we're doing and the beauty about SUP is like you could really reach to the youngest person in the world and the oldest person and then as a professional we're trying to push ourselves to go as fast as we can and get to the finish line quicker than the next guy but um, it, it adds to it because there's a lot more like at stake it feels like and when there's a lot more at stake you tend to push a little harder um, so when when you're gonna have a, all those people after their races and hopefully watching our races you're just gonna be motivated to push harder so it's cool well the event down on Sunday at Docklands uh, next to XL it's a real amphitheater and it's gonna be a real opportunity for people to get right over the race oh, yeah. and watch a really Hear people cheering yeah, on. Yeah, their voices know. Cool. Yeah, it's going to be an awesome event. Uh, as the sport continues to go in different directions and so many different facets of it, and it just continues to grow at such a huge rate um, and be so inclusive for so many people, do you think that as the sport grows and the APP World Tour goes on and becomes grows and grows and grows, and becomes more and more known, with the inclusion of surfing and skateboarding in the next Olympic phase? Is there room for stand-up paddleboarding, do you think? Um, yeah, I think so eventually. I don't think it'll probably happen in the next um, couple of cycles. I think it's still, the sport as a whole, it, like it's got to find its own identity, I think. I think there's a lot of different influences at the moment trying to have power over the sport, but I think the sport's really moving at a, a really good rate. I think the amateur participation, seeing like so many juniors coming in and then seeing how the professional side of things is actually moving along quite quickly. Um, it's a really exciting time to be part of the sport. Well, what the APP World Tour is doing for us as athletes is, is amazing, like bringing us to like, key locations like London, San Francisco, Paris and New York. Like These are the iconic locations you've always wanted to race in. These are the locations you've always heard about. So to be able to bring those, those um, events to the cities is fantastic and hopefully we can catch the eyes of um, the, the bigger corporations and companies to sort of help build the sport and then uh, for the Olympics, I think uh, the sport will eventually be involved in it. I think there's there's no saying in that. It's just when, I think, and um, we'll just see what happens. Yeah, I think the coolest thing about it potentially being the Olympics is just seeing if everyone had to ride the same board. You know what I mean? Like, everyone's riding. In terms of one design. One design. I think that's probably the, the coolest thing. And obviously, when it's in the Olympics, it's sort of like globally kind of gets becomes an official sport of some kind, you yeah. know, which is kind of strange, but I guess it's just having the viewership to watch it. And I've seen with a lot of these other sports that are in the Olympics, though, is that, um, you know, just because they're in the Olympics doesn't necessarily mean that's like the key thing to the sport. Like I would think it within surfing, it's going to be like, wow, cool, you won an Olympic gold medal in surfing. But at the same time, like to the core world, I think it's going to always come down to that world championship and people would rather have a world title than an Olympic gold medal necessarily. Um, and I think in some sports it's the opposite, you know, case, but with standard it's paddling... It's, well, it's funny because in snowboarding, when snowboarding went into the Olympics for the first time, it was like, they had X yeah. Games and everything else going on around it. And it was almost that there wasn't this massive focus shift to the Olympics, it was still X Games for a lot of athletes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the same thing and with surfing, in, unless it's going to be in a wave pool, um, it's really tricky because surfing, to, to call somebody the best surfer in the world by one event, and typically in probably super marginal conditions, is the, the, the hardest part. Whereas stand-up paddling, I mean, it's just if it's flat water and a good buoy setup, I mean, the best paddler that week could be that weekend. But it's kind of cool to know that you grinded it out all season. And I think that truly proves if you're the best or you're not, you know? Yeah. Um, 
and and but the Olympics, like I said, is such a global thing, and to be a part of something like that and represent your country, you know, like um, in other countries, stand up paddling may be represented better, even though I think it's still pretty small. But like in the United States, you know, most of the sports, unless it's a ball sport, is like you don't even get. You're not you're barely on the radar unless you're doing something crazy. Yeah. And it usually has to involve giant waves or paddling across the Pacific or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, awesome. Well, look, guys, thank you very much. Um, all the very, very best for the event this weekend in London uh, and for the rest of the World Tour. Um, thanks, everyone, for watching. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks a lot.